Good afternoon, everybody. It is Wednesday. It's the 17th of November. Today we have a guest speaker, uh, and you know him well, Dr. Uh, Robert Turner. He goes by Rusty. You bet. Thank you, Rob. And good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everybody. And I will hopefully make this more of a, a dialogue, at least initially it'll be a monologue from me. And what stimulated it, <clears throat> excuse me, tended to be, and I'll turn up and get some water, excuse me. <clears throat> um, I guess the, the frequency that I have been seeing kids as well as adults over the years with various types of tics and movement disorders, and obviously this is called TikTok tics, and so I tried to say that TikTok TikTok and say that multiple times over and over to improve my articulation, but anyway, here we are. So um, a little background, and then we will get to talking about this thing going viral, what they're calling TikTok ticks, and then I have some papers that Rob can send that you can review, and um, trying to look if we're, are we looking at a phenomenon, are we looking at an epiphenomenon, and I will give you what seems to be a current neurological perspective. I can't say I often agree with some of my colleagues' neurological uh, impressions and conclusions, but we'll talk about that in a bit. So many of you in your practices see individuals that have various types of tick problems, movement disorders and things, and we'll talk about that. So the goal for me, as with everything, is how do we turn this into a health talk? What do we do about it? So it started for me in my practice some years ago when, and hopefully the slide is showing up okay. I'm going to try to make it large enough. <clears throat> so please let me know if I, if you don't see the screen or there's other problems. It looks problems. good. Looks good. I had read in the works of Mari Swingle and some others early on this that at least a finding that seems to be more notorious, more more prevalent now than ever in my career, is from an eyes open sample to an eyes closed sample. Many people, kids and adults, are demonstrating a tremendous difference in the demonstration, almost a super enhanced demonstration of their posterior dominant rhythm. To yeah. some extent, that's normal. We know there's a difference from eyes open to eyes closed in EEG and things, but this was pretty dramatic and hundreds of percentile increase, magnitude increase. And so I began to ask, is this some type of an EEG marker, a biomarker? And it's still not really addressed at all in the EEG literature or the epilepsy uh, or the neurology world, but it's certainly, so I just kept testing the hypothesis and the hypothesis seems to be true. So what does it mean? First, I started looking at it um, and just what did it mean? What were, what were similar symptoms that people were experiencing with this kind of uh, uh, phenomenon? And much of it seemed attributable to screens, not just the social media effect, but the blue light. And, and then that expanded into investigating the effect of EMF, electromagnetic frequency, or uh, radio frequency on us as human beings, what the literature has shown on the effect with uh, other living organisms, mammals and things that we know we have affected by our worldwide increased prevalence of um, man-made electromagnetic fields. So anyway, the, this started a few years ago among many kids that I was seeing in my practice. Uh, this really bright young man with so-called intractable Tourette syndrome came for another opinion. Uh, had been on quite a few meds at that time. I think I have it here. He was on six meds over a time span. Um, and so, but he demonstrated at a reasonable sensitivity um, 
quite a bit of difference over this posterior of the occipital region where we see that so-called alpha rhythm. I prefer to call it posterior dominant rhythm because even young kids have a posterior dominant rhythm, as you know, that's not in the 8 to 12 hertz range. So it's a posterior dominant rhythm. In did mapping with him, and there's different ways of looking at mapping, as you well know. This is done with the NeuroGuide technology. But markers that I started seeing or patterns over and over and trying to tie that together with symptom checklists and things. Um, and this low power at one hertz frequency when you do the appropriate filtering consistently seemed to me to make sense as being an indication of a uh, deficit of slow wave sleep. I just feel like if you're not getting that first 90 minute cycle of sleep at night because of what's going on in the hours and hours before bedtime, you're not getting the restorative sleep, so the brain's not charged. So this is sort of low charging, low power, as I would explain to families. But I started seeing a lot of this high power in the beta 18, 19, 20, 30 hertz range, high frequency power spectral changes. It could be both absolute and relative. We won't talk about that today. As well as a lot of variability and coherence, where blue is the slow processing, as you know, it's not processing as well. And seeing that in these young people began to be a problem. So this compares him when he came in. Initially in August, we made some recommendations. This young man did not end up getting our feedback because I thought there was too many other lifestyle issues getting in the way of him responding optimally to neurofeedback. And there's been a good uh, uh, banter of some emails recently on the listserv, of course, about what happens when people get worse. And I think that's been addressed really well. We need to look at what's changing in the individual because frequently it's not the neurofeedback that's making somebody worse. We're changing their brain. They're getting into a different environmental experience and that can bring out what look to be abnormal symptoms by the observers, but that's another conversation. So this man had dramatic changes in his, just by doing these lifestyle changes. Well, what lifestyle changes were that? Well, we focused on, uh, this was a very upstanding, let me go back here, very upstanding family in the area, very wealthy, very bright kid at a, at a top school. And, we talked about what I usually go into is moving, eating, disconnecting, sleeping, look at your lifestyle habits, but we focused in on EMF and screens because that was obviously a huge issue with him as it is with probably most of us since most of us live on screens and we'll get to that in a few minutes. So they actually took some of what I said seriously. We based on what we discussed with the functional mapping and when they came back, he was having some problems with headaches but he was also increasingly refusing to use his blue light screen glasses, which they'd gotten for very cheap. You don't have to have fancy prescription sunglasses. We talked about blue light, I'll go over that in a bit. Um, and of course, computer and smart board use, the smart boards at schools don't have blue filter on them and so on. The biggest issue is the frequency of this young man's ticks, which were very, very, very frequent, very problematic, sometimes worse, rarely better with the multiple medications that he'd been tried on. They were virtually gone. Remarkable improvement. 80% better by his parents' uh, observations, very astute parents. I don't think they did any specific counting per minute, but they were blown away. They were um, convinced by their experience that these simple changes had resulted in uh, these changes in his tics and his Tourette's symptoms just by some pretty simple com com common sense things. They made a lot of sleep improvements. They'd improved his sleep environment, looked at turning off wireless router at night, not having electronics within 10 feet, three meters of his sleeping, getting electronics out of the bedroom, decreasing it before bedtime and so on. And he did it really pretty well, not perfectly. How many people implement our recommendations perfectly? And so then within a few months, I started to see more people this way. 
I saw another young man, uh, again, coming in with chronic motor tics, another second opinion, had been on several trials of medication. And looking at his maps, again, before and after sleep, and I attribute a lot of this to sleep, that's my opinion, we can discuss that. Some of those aspects had improved his higher amplitude and things got worse. Something's going on with this young man. We made changes. So I started just implementing these lifestyle changes with people. Some would get neurofeedback and we'll come to talk about that at the end. So on and on through practice. I also now in the last year or so have been traveling to do what's called locum tenens where there's cover hospitals where there's a shortage of pediatric neurologists and started seeing before they hit the press these calls uh, coming in from the emergency rooms of these young people with explosive, uh, what was termed explosive onset of complex tics of various types. They implicated a lot more adolescent females and that's still this feeling with what's being now called tick tock ticks. Um, so basically, if you haven't heard of it, uh, there is an increased prevalence of ticks. It's not just in, um, I have it somewhere here, but it's in clinics and emergency rooms, people being seen for emergency or urgent assessment with rapid onset of complex motor and complex vocal tick-like behaviors. They're wording things carefully in these interviews and then some of these articles. Uh, been 70%, two thirds of cases, no prior history of ticks. They developed rapidly over the course of hours to days. Level of disability was extremely high. Many unable to attend school due to the severity of their symptoms. Some even requiring hospital admissions. And I'll, I made a PDF of this Medscape interview, so that will be available too afterwards. But uh, when I first saw this pop up last May, I was encouraged, not that this is going on, but that were other uh, observant neurologists experiencing this, oh my gosh, what's happening? And this is, I think, a, a, a small part of what my experience is at many hospitals with many ER physicians, many intensive care physicians, that it is a different world right now. We are seeing more and more kids filling up the hospitals with higher levels of higher acuity of illness, and very little is related to COVID itself as an illness or as an infection, uh, but it's definitely increased during COVID for many, during the COVID changed world for many reasons. Anyway, so these, these are two pediatric movement disorder specialists uh, in Chicago and one in Calgary, and they had this interview. They started, like I did, reaching around to other colleagues around the world, and I, I picked on them first because they their specialty is pediatric movement disorders. The next article I'll talk about also deals with pediatric movement disorder specialists. So I've seen many, many kids through the years with movement disorders and other types of neurological problems. I am not a movement disorder trained physician although I've done additional training in movement disorders and deep brain stimulation and all that. So I'm not speaking as an expert like these people, but I also don't totally agree with their, what I think is a, a presumed bias that they brought into their thinking, which I'm guilty of too. So you'll be able to pick that out and, and comment on that soon. So in their discussions, all of these colleagues around the world were seeing comparable cases with striking similarities in phenomenology of these tick-like, they called it, behaviors. Cases continue to grow, so on. And they go into the interview. I, I, we often talk very intelligently in our writing. Two subtypes of these rapid onset cases, basically the ones that did have ticks before and the ones that didn't. That's not too fancy, but a larger proportion of the young people have comorbid anxiety and depression. I think you as providers are seeing that across the board. I would expect that, which is why I don't think you have a problem with finding 
clients or patients to help the problem is waiting lists and seeing people and getting the help at the depth because you're looking at the big picture and trying to get at the root of problems uh, rather than just sometimes sort of symptom management. So they were comparing these young people with this, what we loosely call TikTok ticks with Tourette's syndrome, which is a little bit apples and oranges, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but they were saying the comorbid anxiety and depression was more common with this type of phenomenon than it was with traditional Tourette's syndrome, whatever that is, where there was more ADHD, hyperactivity disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, things like that. So I see kind of what they're classifying, but there's a big spectrum of tick disorders. I'll go over that in just a minute. So Chris Getz, a very amazing movement disorder, pediatric movement disorder specialist, and colleagues published this article uh, earlier this year, more recently in Movement Disorders Clinical Practice, in which they talk about this thing called TikTok ticks. And I learned more what TikTok is. A lot of you may be already prolific or know what it is, but basically it's a video sharing um, platform that apparently has taken off all over the world by wildfire. The numbers are extreme as far as exposures and things. So they did a good job describing things and uh, going over that. And then they um, looked at the numbers of exposures. They broke things down. They basically did an analysis during a two week period, a little over two weeks in March, 2021, and then looked at the assessment. They, at that point, they're, the mean age was 18 years old, so teenage, later teenagers, the majority were women. Unlike predominance of facial movements with, quote, typical tics, as they called it, arm movements and other body trunkal movements were the most frequent. Average tics per minute, 29. That's one every other second. That's a lot of stuff going on. Significant disability. Uh, whereas corporalalia, which is the speaking profanities and things, and self-injurious behavior only infrequently encountered in typical tick disorders, they were present in an overwhelming majority of TikTok subjects. Not all these people were exposed to TikTok. However, this was the, that's how it kind of came to be sort of labeled as TikTok ticks. I don't think TikTok is the absolute problem, but obviously social media is a concern. They basically, like many other movement disorder people, where I'm going with this, they concluded that this is an example of mass sociogenic illness. I don't know if my mouse is showing going around in circles. If it is, hopefully I can keep focus on where these busy slides are going. That involves behaviors, emotions, and conditions spreading spontaneously through a group. So they classify this as what's come to be known over the last eight to 10 years. The new term is FND, functional neurological disorders. In my simplistic understanding, the term functional is the new fancy term for what used to be called psychogenic. And, uh, and prior to that, his, the term hysterical with its gender, obviously bias, hysterical seizures, hysterical movement disorders, we know that it's not uh, gender specific. And so fortunately, terms like that have um, been lessened in their use or misuse in the medical profession. Uh, the other term would be pseudo, like pseudo seizures, which simply means fake. And most people who have, and we talked about this previously with non epileptic events and things, you know, they may. They're not faking it. There is issues of malingering, um, but I still believe there's a significant brain basis, and you can see that with functional mapping. And therefore, when you see that and you work with your clients, you can offer help to them in telling, instead of telling them it's, quote, in your head, unquote, and go see a mental health provider or a psychiatrist, which may help. They may get to those issues, but when I would discuss that with families, I would say, yeah, it is in your head. Literally, it's in our head. And when we do mapping, 
uh, and functional EEG, you can see these things. Functional, not used in the same way they use this term. So TikTok, as you may know, users create and share videos through pro personal profiles or pages. The use has grown immensely, 700 million globally. This is based on data a few months ago. In the US, users age 10 to 19, they said accounted for 25% of these accounts. I put in only, because that's just a quarter. So it's obviously throughout the age span, this isn't just teenagers that are being seen. It came to my attention because I'm not seeing adults in the emergency rooms and in the hospital setting. So it obviously increased tremendously as many other internet-based, social media-based things during COVID. So again, they noticed the increase of 7% just during this three-week period that they were looking uh, for up to 5.8 billion views at TikTok. What they saw apparently, those of you that know TikTok, is you can label things. And so there was more specific to Tourette's and, and ticks that somehow can be labeled. So people were, so basically I think they're saying it was mimicking. People would be focusing on cycling on these types of videos and then they would mimic the behavior. Given that both TikTok and neurology clinics have seen abrupt increase in ticks during the COVID pandemic, their goal was to compare TikTok with typically seeing Tourette's, the problems of ticks in clinics. And again, I think it's a little bit apples and oranges, but they basically, because it didn't look like Tourette's syndrome primarily, they tended to say, well, this is more likely a functional disorder. I don't disagree that there may be functional components, but one of the definitions, well, let me go to that in just a couple minutes here. So. These users, severe tick movements, atypical for organic tick disorders, suggesting of a unique etiology because it was more late adolescence, but there are younger kids being seen. Uh, so again, he, they said it was an example of social contagion or mass sociogenic illness. Um, and they just concluded by saying clinicians need to be aware of what's going on in social media and so on. So I, this isn't helping a lot. This was a Wall Street Journal article, and I think somebody shared this link in the, on the New Mind listserv as well. But teenagers across the globe have been showing up at doctor's office with tics, physical jerking movements, verbal outbursts. Again, they're bringing in this mass sociogenic thing. Um, quick thing with tics, definitions of tics with either the World Health Organization, if you go there, or other movement disorder places, the, there's basically three different things. Transient tick disorder has been described for years, either motor or vocal tics, unsustained, they're intermittent, they don't go on longer than 12 months, they may go on for a few weeks, but it's motor or vocal, that can occur at any age, and there's something called monophasic, transient tick disorder. It occurs in my experience in some of the literature up to 25% of kids go through some type of a transient tick disorder at some time in their life. There's still an organic basis. There's psychosocial issues that need to be looked at. Chronic motor or vocal tick disorder are daily ticks, either motor or vocal for greater than one year. Then it's called chronic motor tick disorder or chronic vocal tick disorder. Um, and then there's this phenomenon combined motor and vocal tick disorder, or they changed the term multiple motor tick disorder, and that's been called Tourette's syndrome, where these combined ticks are present, present, excuse me, essentially daily for about a year. So that's the basic definitions from my current understanding. I think there's some of you that might be listening in that have more expertise and actually work with some of the Tourette's foundations. So that's always open for discussion. I would go into history, except it's gonna be afternoon and put people to sleep, but I love history. I love that we often don't learn from history, but the amazing Dr. Charcot trains some incredible uh, physicians through his tenure, considered by some the modern, the father of modern or parent of modern neurology. He was involved in training Freud, and Georges Albert Edouard Brutu, Jeux de la Tourette, our famous Tourette, Dr. Tourette, Georges de Tourette, where this disorder took its name. 
just by way of history. I, I love, and you see this in the media often, a new discovery hits the press and uh, many things that are so-called new aren't new at all. And this new discovery, these ticks have been going on. The, the discovery, the discussion of ticks and threat-like behaviors has been going on for quite a long time. You can go back to the 1400s, of course, throughout the 1800s, even uh, Dr. Trousseau in the description of motor and vocal tics, and um, even Dr. Tourette, uh, Gilles de Tourette referred that to in his, his 1885 publication, but was mildly critical. I put that in the italics of Trousseau's earlier observations. We're really good at sometimes looking down our nose and kind of judging others, and I am. Um, I guess I'm doing that in the way I'm speaking, but I just think we need to be open-minded and look at the big picture. Even Dr. Jackson described it. So what about ticks? Ticks, basically, you can do your homework. I, I, um, I love sort of the general. I went to the world-famous Wikipedia and some of the other medical websites, but basically ticks are to believe result from dysfunction in the CNS. Yeah, that's a pretty good definition. Cortical, subcortical regions, and of course, the deep gray matter. What I found is interesting is over and over, neuroanatomic models implicate failure in circuits. We know now more than ever before, the brain is a network, a series of networks. When you're doing your therapy interventions, your healthcare interventions, you're trying to influence the network connections. Neurofeedback is working to improve the network dynamics in people's brains. So. What's been known and here at your hands, it, it, you have the ability to help people along that health path. So dopamine excess or supersensitivity, and you've heard that dopamine's involved and so on. Histamine also, some of the histamine receptors in the basal ganglia have a focus. So I won't go into this. This isn't a lecture on pathophysiology, but in healthcare, we use a lot of medications, and uh, so we throw people on the medicines, which focus the dopamine blockade, sometimes looking at serotonergic receptors as well as dopaminergic receptors. So, and medicines can help. They're just like Tylenol for the fever. They might help decrease the fever, but they're not curative. They're not getting to the root of the problem, which I think essentially is what most people in this audience and many, many healthcare providers in the world are standing for is let's get to the root of things. So quickly, FND, we're hearing more and more of that term. Uh, again, functional to me, it's a newer term for what used to be psychogenic. It's just our polite way of saying uh, that's a psychogenic disorder. And often the, the diagnosis is um, or is a problem with functioning in the nervous system. I would agree with that. And the brain and body send signals rather than a structural disease process. The assumption with statements like this, whether it's from NORD, National Association of Rare Diseases, or the NIH, or wherever your health sources are, is it implies if you can see it on a test, meaning the tests that we believe in, which are MRIs and EEGs, if those are normal, it's probably something functional. Well, we know many things that don't show up on MRI and EEG show up blazing with quantitative EEG assessment. So anyway, that's where FND, so you're, I'm hearing more about this all the time, and it's still as a neurologist or a neuroscience provider, how do I help people? How do I get to the bottom of it? I don't play mental health provider, but there's got to be ways to help. So FND has motor dysfunction, sensory dysfunction, episodes of altered awareness, and you can find these on the various websites and information. So again, in neurology, we typically say, oh, this is hysterical, this is psychogenic, this is whatever. So it's not neurological, so most neurologists don't really get involved. But there are, as you can see now, millions of young people experiencing these phenomenology of increased tics and other neurological symptoms that are maybe being blown off a little too much. Dr. Stone is uh, a neurologist in the UK and Scotland and has taken the lead in functional neurological disorder. And if you don't really 
understand the disorder, you can just call it functional neurological symptoms, but it's caused by a problem with the functioning of the nervous system. I can't agree with that more. And functioning is an organic problem with the brain, just because we don't see it in the standard test that we as physicians might order. I love it. He calls it a software issue of the brain. What are you dealing with every day in your practices? The software, not the hardware. And when we train and understand and work with the software, we change the hardware. The mind, in my understanding, our mind changes my brain, not necessarily the reverse. So uh, talk about a few articles and then we'll have a, uh, some discussion. So I, I have been seeing more, a little resurgence in some literature called the precautionary principle. I'll get to that in a minute. But because of that principle, my practice approach, education approach, teaching, lifestyle approach has been promote health. I think all of us in this audience listening would consider themselves health care providers. And you've heard me harp on that before. Often today, I think we get stuck being disease managers more than health care providers, or I become a health care prescriber far more than a health care provider and on and on, I can get off on that. So we should promote health and we should avoid harm. Key point, even potential harm. Um, we know a lot of information about smoking, we've learned a lot. We know that physicians were among the biggest proponents of smoking back in the 1920s, 30s, 40s. How good it was, it promoted better breathing, better taste, better, you know, yada, yada, yada. And we look back now and kind of cringe at what we called science, but I promote something called safe meds. I've added the safe, I'll talk about that in just a minute. My personal presupposition, bias, belief, conviction is that we are, prime, as humans, primarily electromagnetic creations, electromagnetic beings, not primarily chemical. Chemicals help, medications can work, they can be life-saving in many situations, but overall our Medical therapy is not doing a great job for chronic long-term diseases. And so let's un we understand ourselves. And again, I think with the lectures that you hear and the talks here, with the presentations that Richard's been doing, um, Dr. Souter, is we understand this is where we come from. And we have at our fingertips an electromagnetic technology, which is with neurofeedback, which is Incredible, even if a lot of people still don't believe in it. S, safe, sleep, activity, food, or fasting, intermittent fasting, and environment. I do it because I think the safe I added in because I think we live in a world where people aren't safe. And when we're not safe, everything blows up. Spiritually, psychologically, physiologically, and Moving is the thing you've probably heard me do before. Move, eat, disconnect, sleep. I'm not going to go into all those. That's a whole other workshop. But I also have my second tier meds called mindfulness, energy work, diaphragmatic breathing, spirituality. I'll say it here and then I'll let it go. But I spend a lot of time trying to get families to start with some. Here's what you can start today in the hospital with some basic diaphragmatic breathing. Teach them quick, simple things that they can do to try to hijack the train before it starts running down the mountain. Spirituality, big issue. Anyway, um, and again, it's we live in an increasingly electromagnetically toxic world. And uh, if any of you are interested, it's available for purchase, unfortunately, not free, but there was something called EMF, Electromagnetic Frequency Conference 2021. A lot of excellent science presentations. The Executive Director of Physicians for Safe Technology is Cindy Lee Russell, uh, physician. And so where I go with these next couple slides is I still believe from the precautionary principle. Now let me come back to this. The precautionary principle is that in light of all the science that's there, even though things aren't always conclusively proven, 
we should be precautionary. If there's a question back in the 1930s that smoking might be hazardous, especially the kids, maybe we shouldn't expose them to secondhand smoke. Let's be precaution, let's exhibit precaution before we start moving forward. We don't really see that happening in the world of uh, electromagnetic fields and wireless technology where we're just forging forward. Because we're electromagnetic beings, I believe we have significant health implications from our increasing exposure to electromagnetic fields, and there's good basic science and mechanisms of action. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some papers. And so Cindy said wireless technology has become the dominant form of communication. We know that with human health exposure guidelines largely sent by the engineers looking at the heat effects. Well, it's not always done with heat. Um, I'll come back to that. So the biological and health effects of electromagnetic frequencies have been reported at levels far below safety thresholds in the scientific literature, and they are generally not only under-recognized, but not even really addressed in the medical community, much of the medical community at large. So her talk, she was looking at non-ionizing radiation in wireless devices, which are ever increasing. You can get all the boosters for your house and things, and people have different susceptibilities. We're all exposed to, exposed to EMF. Not everybody has EMF-related symptoms. We're all exposed to sunlight. Not everybody that's exposed to sunlight gets skin cancer, so, so on and so forth. As our precautionary principle, as parents and healthcare providers, we're heavily invested in protecting our children, yet they're the ones most vulnerable, more exposure than most of us ever had growing up as kids. And the vulnerability of the pediatric nervous system is much more than our somewhat more mature nervous systems. So anyway, I would agree with her that um, we've got a problem. We have more kids ever with chronic health conditions, which sets us up for more medical problems. We know that most people who developed COVID-related uh, infection and complications had at least one, if not multiple, comorbid-related uh, issues. So EMF inf influences a wide range of bodily functions. It's ubiquitous. There's plenty of good papers. I can show you papers that say it's got an effect, papers that say it doesn't have an effect. So trying to be precautious, uh, pre exhibit precaution with this. So because of the possibility for human effects, I don't think it can be underestimated. We should be preparing. We should be thinking about it and saying, could this be a factor in the people we're seeing? Hence, could this be a factor in these young people with TikTok-related tics or this, whatever this is happening, this thing called TikTok tics? I believe it is. And so in watching people implement changes, I see people changing rather than just dealing with CBT to deal with their tick or functional neurological disorder as valuable as CBT is as a, a mode of therapy. So the need of the hour, and this is almost 10 years ago from these physicians, the need of the hour is to activate comprehensive, well-coordinated, blinded scientific investigations, overcoming previous limitations, demerits, so on and so forth. Uh, the public should follow the precautionary principles as I've talked about. In their paper, they quote from the 70s, Dr. Becker, who was nominated for the Nobel Prize. He's got some incredible things that he's written, if you ever get to do some reading. This is said in the 1970s. I have no doubt in my mind at the present time, the greatest polluting element in the Earth's environment is the proliferation of electromagnetic fields. Um, and just going back real quick here. Uh, when he said that, uh, it reminds me of a cartoon I found. Those who don't study history are doomed to repeat it, yet those who do study history are doomed to stand by and helplessly while everyone else repeats it. Hopefully, I guess people are probably muted, but maybe there was a, a chuckle in that. So let's move on. A few papers, what am I doing? I've been privileged to be invited into this worldwide collaboration, working ultimately with the World Health Organization at developing biomarkers and imaging. Unfortunately, QEG is slow to take off. 
but looking for biomarkers in what's called electrohypersensitivity syndrome, used to be called microwave syndrome. And of course, that's some limited term. Uh, the, it's really led by Dr. Belpalm and his colleagues in France, but working with others. You'll see names like Martin Paul, Yale Stein, Moskowitz, others, just incredible people around the world looking at this issue. This paper, and I'll include it if anybody wants to read it, is more uh, mechanism-based, looking at the importance, not so much talking about EHS itself. And Rob will send out a couple papers that talk about electrosensitivity, hypersensitivity syndrome, EHS, and what that looks like. And I've talked about that in some previous um, talks. So is there a mechanism? Is there any basis for me to think that these young people and not so young people being afflicted around the world in a pandemic uh, situation could have something other than mass sociogenic influences and a functional uh, etiology? I think there is. The mechanisms of what EMF does, again, we know EMF has benefit. It's been known for years to have benefit in wound healing, bone healing, EMF, uh, electromagnetic for bone healing. But like many things, the, the sun is very good for things. It's damaging for other things. Nuclear energy is very good for things and can be obviously used detrimentally. That's my, again, very simplistic black and white thinking there. But mechanisms have been proposed looking at voltage-gated calcium channels, but one of the other papers is looking at its widespread effects on the nervous system, apoptosis, nerve myelin ion channels, and also looking at what it can do to the dopamine systems in the deep gray, the striatal networks. So I keep asking, could this be part of the mechanism? Uh, so telling people to quit social media, good luck with that, but decreasing social media, but all look at, look at how are they protecting themselves from blue light with every screen use they're doing, how are they decreasing their EMF? So I think there's plausible explanations to explain why this free and simple stuff, we can take lifestyle precautionary changes to improve our health. There's been tremendous emails on this listserv when I talk about move, eat, disconnect, sleep, um, Dr. Uh, Yannick and the others, look at the eat, look at the brain gut, look at the nutrition, look at the supplements, how much that's impacting our health and what we can do to uh, improve our overall health and brain health. Uh, I'll stop here. I just, papers, papers, papers. I have an ever increasing set, couple hundred articles going back actually before 2005, but one of the seminal papers was published in Pediatrics, the preeminent world pediatric journal in 2005 on sensitivity of children to EMF. This is nothing new, but where is our precautionary principle in healthcare today? I'm just not seeing it very much. So that's my time to stop. That was longer than I thought, but that's the scoop. Great information, Rusty. Thank you again. I know you're a busy guy and uh, you put a lot of work into presenting these with a beautiful sunset closing. So um, thanks so much again. Uh, that I have sent the papers out. They are on the listserv that uh, Rusty sent to us. So you can take a look at those and we'll see everybody Friday. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you very much, Rusty. Have a great day. Thanks, Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.